I'm really pleased to welcome um, Professor Navedita Majumdar um, to our lecture series. Um, this is actually when I, in a previous life at SVA, when I was um, chairing a master's program, Professor Majumdar came and gave a talk um, which was before the book was written. Um, it was kind of a talk about the, the theoretical chapter, the first big chapter of the book. And now here the book exists and five years later, six years later? I don't know, was it that far? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, it seems uh, like the other bit. Uh, but, uh, now she's back to um, speak about what is now a finished work. So it's kind of cool to have been able to see that process of what begins as sort of a number of ideas becoming a finished work, a book, um, and an important book that is a, uh, uh, a new departure um, in post-colonial literary theory as well as a in-depth analysis of several works of literature from the non-Western world, um, including uh, e uh, the Middle East, um, including uh, uh, India and Sri Lanka, which I think she'll share some of those analyses today. Um, very briefly, I also say Professor Majumdar is a professor at John Jay College in CUNY, so not too far from here, um, a neighboring school, and uh, she has another book, um, The Other Side of Terror, uh, worth checking out, and really, um, let's just give her a tremendously warm welcome for joining us tonight. Thanks so much, Jeremy, and um, you guys can hear me back there, right? Because I was trying to figure out whether to stand and with the microphone or just sit and it just feels a little more informal and that okay, everyone? Okay, great. Um, okay, so I'll um, get started and uh, maybe at the end uh, do the questions, right, Jeremy? Yeah, that makes sense. First of all, thank you so much for coming. I know it's the end of the semester. You guys probably have papers to write and other important things to do. So hopefully it's worth your while. Um, so earlier this week, I was rereading some of Jhumpa Lahiri's stories. I think she's an um, amazingly skilled writer. Her craft is truly impressive. I have issues with her politics, and in my book, I critique one of her novels. But I do enjoy reading her, especially when she's doing what she's best at, depicting the immigrant experience. So out of curiosity, I watched a New Yorker interview of her on YouTube. There, reflecting on the creative process, she says that writing was a private solace for her, a place where she could be herself free of the pressures that comes from being a second generation immigrant, feeling like an imposter both at home and outside. But as her writing gained wide recognition, she realized even though her experience was private, it was one people could relate to all over the world. Generalizing from that, she spoke about how literature engaging with the private sphere has this capacity to portray what is universal. It was good to hear Lahiri on this, not because her point was specially original or unique, but because it was the experienced realization of a writer of what the best in literature offers, an interplay between the particular and the universal. It reminded me of the writer Omar Barghouti, who noted that it is precisely through the portrayal of the intimate and the personal that the Palestinian poet expands their horizon to embrace the universal. I also um, discuss his book in, in my book. My book emerges from a discomfort with some of the fundamental premises of post-colonial theory and its most concrete manifestation is what I have found to be a misreading of post-colonial literature. <clears throat> that misreading is embedded in a rejection of this dialectic that writers and readers all over the world have known and experienced between the specific, the concrete, the particular, and the universal. To unpack this dynamic, it is helpful to recall that the conditions of the emergence of post-colonial theory as I discuss in the introduction to my book, postcolonial studies made its definitive entry into academia at a time when the neoliberal ag agenda of the Reagan-Thatcher era with its deregulation of markets, free trade, and the decimation of labor unions had become the reigning doctrine. The discipline emerged under the peculiar conditions where on the one hand, labor power was decidedly trounced, <clears throat> 
but it was also the product of more than a decade of flourishing social movements. An increasingly diverse student body and broad social movements led to fundamental shifts in the content of education, away from canonical texts and towards the democratization of the curriculum. Postcolonial thought emerged in this milieu from the broad umbrella of the new left, a product of its times, encapsulating the contradictory poles of liberalism and conservatism. The contradiction is evident tellingly in the representation of the global south, i.e. the nerve center of the theory. Consistent with the progressive underpinnings of the theory, it centers the study of literatures from the erstwhile colonized world. In fact, the most remarkable contribution of the theory is that it has transformed the curriculum of English literary studies by prying it open to include literatures from the global south. And it has drawn attention to the impact of colonial ideology in cultural production in ways that are deeper and more expansive than anything done prior to that through Marxist or feminist analysis. If centering literatures from the global south testifies to the progressive bent of postcolonial theory, the contradiction emerges in the lens that is applied to study the works from that part of the world. The theory rightly highlights ways in which colonial ideology erases the specificities of the colonized world. Its distinctiveness becomes a casualty of the violence of colonialism. However, the corrective that the theory advances to such violence is to invert the dynamic and read the colonized world primarily in terms of particularity or what is often called singularity. The culture of the colonized is upheld as an oppositional site only by virtue of its difference from the colonizer. To state it in more clear terms, the dynamic proceeds like this. Colonial ideology suppresses both the heterogeneity and humanity of, of the colonized by casting the latter as irredeemably different or other. Postcolonial theory seeks to challenge such suppression by upholding the specificity of the colonized culture, but in doing so, it reinforces the colonial premise of essentialized difference. In his iconic essay on third world literature, Frederick Jameson holds that the valorization and resu resultant essentialization of colonized culture poses a conundrum, one that Jameson nevertheless believes that the field should simply embrace. He insists that all third world literary production should be read as embodying what he calls the radical difference of that world. Now, Jameson understands well the inherent risks of such a move. He observes that once we speak of radical difference, it becomes susceptible to appropriation by that strategy of otherness or what Edward Said called Orientalism. Jameson was clear that it did not matter if anti-colonial critics praised or valorized the colonial culture, the operation of differentiation and therefore of Orientalism is in place. In spite of such a clear appreciation of the pitfalls of reading colonized cultures in terms of radical difference, Jameson nevertheless embraced such a strategy because for him, the alternative is to avow a kind of old school liberalism, which is worse. My book is in a way an answer to Jameson and his insistence on radical difference. I argue that Jameson is right in his articulation of the dangers of such a category, namely that it amounts to an embrace of exoticization of the global south and that he's wrong in holding that there is no other alternative for challenging colonial ideology. In fact, much of post-colonial literature offers us precisely that alternative that Jameson struggles with. These literary texts, as I discuss in the book, instead of rep representing the radical difference of the colonized world, are instead embedded in a universalism rooted in local realities, but also capable of unearthing the needs, conflicts, and desires that stretch across cultures and time. And that's what I call radical universalism. <laughs>
I'll now discuss two literary texts as example of the phenomena of radical difference and radical universalism. The two novels compare well because they are both set in modern uh, Sri Lanka. Michael Ondaatje's Anil's Ghost, uh, published in 2000, is widely regarded as a quintessentially postcolonial novel and praised for its depiction of the Sri Lankan civil war. The novel has been roundly applauded for encapsulating a post-colonial critique of Western discourses and for its focus on the phenomenological dimension of post-colonial conflict. The other novel we'll consider is A. Shivanandan's When Memory Dies, published in 97. Even though the writer was well known in the British intellectual and political scene, scores of publishers rejected the manuscript before the newly established Arcadia Books decided to publish it. The book, steering clear of contemporary trends in post-colonial fiction, did not conform to publishers' ideas of what a novel about the subcontinent should look like. Upon publication in 1997, the novel did receive two prestigious awards and proved a commercial success. Nevertheless, it remains a marginal work in post-colonial studies, garnering nowhere near the attention lavished on Anil's ghost. The text does offer helpful material for comparative study. It is necessary to have a brief overview of the setting of both novels, the political landscape of Sri Lanka. The country, as is widely known, has been torn by a civil war lasting nearly three decades. The underlying issues have to do with both ethnicity and economics. The Sinhalese, the main ethnic group in the small island nation, comprise three quarters of Sri Lankan's inhabitants. The biggest minority population is of Sri Lankan Tamils and a smaller percentage of Muslims and Christians. The conflict is between the two largest groups, the Sinhalese and the Sri Lankan Tamils and is connected in important ways to the country's earlier class-based Marxist insurrection that took place in 1971 and then again in 1988-89. Both were led by the People's Liberation Front and involved only the Sinhalese segment of the population. Staged primarily by rural Sinhalese youth, the insurrections were grounded in a strong sense of socioeconomic deprivation manifested in extremely uneven industrial development and in rural poverty. The first insurrection ended with a government operation that killed more than 15,000 citizens. In the second, more organized insurrection of 1988-89, a similar military crackdown cost over 50,000 lives. Other than its heavy-handed military response, the government did little by way of substantive reforms to address the issues raised by the insurrections, except for one, cause, uh, one course of action that ended up fueling the inter-ethnic conflict. The state mobilized the old Sinhala Tamil conflict fostered by the British and their time-tested imperialist policy of divide and rule. Using the numerical dominance of the Sinhalese to cast aside a pluralistic polity in favor of a race-based nationalism. So rather than creating more employment and educational opportunities for all, the government instituted programs that would benefit the majority Sinhalese population at the expense of the Tamils. The criteria for university admissions, for instance, was changed so as to reduce the number of Tamils and increase those of the Sinhalese. Another example is that the country abandoned the two-language policy, adopting an official Sinhala-only language policy. And Buddhism was enshrined in the constitution as the official religion. As a clear affront to Hinduism, their religion followed by Tamils. Such institutional marginalization of the Tamil population, combined with the shrinkage in educational and employment opportunities fostered by the post-1989 reforms, caused the emergence of militant Tamil nationalism. The state of hostilities has been fostered by repeated and often systemic attacks on Tamils during the riots of 1958, 1977, 1981, and 1983, attacks in which the complicity of the government has been only too evident. The central Tamil nationalist demand was for a separate homeland, Elam, carved out of the north and northeast areas where the Tamils constitute a clear majority. The movement began to develop in the early 1980s when several organizations claimed to represent Tamil demands. 
Eventually, the liberation tigers of Tamil Elam, uh, known as LTTE, emerged as the sole voice of the population, mainly by having decimated all the other organizations. The ensuing civil war has claimed some 100,000 lives and caused the displacement of over 2 million people. Suicide attacks was the main weapon used by the LTTE against political, economic, and military targets. After several rounds of negotiations and ceasefire agreements between the government and the LTTE, uh, the LTTE was finally defeated in 2009 and dropped its central demand for a separate Tamil state in favor of a federal solution. With this context, let's turn to Anil's ghost. The backdrop to the events in the novel is Sri Lanka in the 1980s, a country in the throes of a civil war. Its protagonist, Anil Tissera, is a US-based forensic patho pathologist employed by the UN. Teaming up with the state-employed archaeologist Sarath, she returns to her homeland, Sri Lanka, on an assignment to investigate possible human rights violation by the government. Anil and Sarath discover a skeleton at a site to which only government workers had access, thus pointing to abuse and a cover-up. It then becomes Anil's mission to establish the identity and the history of the skeleton, which would serve as evidence of systemic human rights violations. The novel has been widely praised for demonstrating the futility of Western frameworks for understanding the Sri Lankan conflict. I'll highlight the observations of Robert Young, who exemplifies the post-colonial commentary on the text. Young contends that while those trained in the West approach the civil war through the lens of interests, rights, legal frameworks, and linear historical causation, Ondachi shows how the war transcends these categories and enters the realm of pure trauma, something perceived but no longer attached to causes, social forces, or political interests. To understand this requires a leap into another conceptual universe, one that eschews the nostrums of Western theory. Young contends that whereas in the first world, terrorism is connected to the abstract fear of immigrants and the imagined threat that they embody, in the post-colonial world, its operation is far more real and visceral. For him, the virtue of Ondachi's novel is its deep appreciation of this difference. And I'm going to quote a little from Young just to capture um, the texture of his critique. So I'm quoting here. It is in Michael Ondachi's Anil's Ghost that we vicariously experience the full extent of a terrorism that has descended into a civil war in which the different sides have become indistinguishable. Train killings, massacres, beheadings, crucifixions, night visitations, kidnappings, murders in broad daylight, here, ter terror has, has moved from the dialectics of traditional terrorism into a porous landscape in which terror has leaked into unreadable forms of arbitrary violence beyond the realm of all political and social institutions of power, in short, into trauma." Unquote. The novel's portrayal of the scale of violence may well be historically accurate. But what makes Young's reading noteworthy is that he not only accepts but also endorses Ondachi's description of the two sides as indistinguishable. In so doing, Young refuses to engage with the complexity of a specific juncture in a country in the global south. Indeed, he describes the very idea of it as futile. The implication is that the Sri Lankan conflict supposedly does not lend itself to the kind of analysis applied to, say, the, sec uh, the strife in Ireland or the Basque separatism in Spain. In this gesture, Young follows Ondachi into the Orientalist universe, wherein conflicts in the South are deemed beyond the reach of political discourse, accessible only as trauma. Other critics have similarly drawn on literary trauma theory to highlight Ondachi's representation of trauma that so often blights the existence of so many post-colonial subjects. Anil, the central protagonist, exhibits a kind of certitude and passion in her work that for her co-worker Sarath is problematic. He tries to both alert her to the political minefield that, uh, um, that they are navigating and also deflate her ethical drive to find evidence for criminal wrongdoing. Sarath succeeds little in deterring Anil from her mission. 
It falls on Palipana, Sarath's former teacher, an exile in every sense of the term, to challenge Anil's worldview. Palipana emerges as the source of an alternative worldview, one avowed by the novel. He offers a con contrast to Anil's faith in scientific methodology and the social value of evidence. He is an epigraphist who, after earning the highest professional accolades, turned away from academia because there was no place in that arena for this kind of knowledge. Palipana challenges the Western forms of knowledge that Anil upholds with what we are given to understand is a non-Western epistemology. The immediate occasion that foregrounds their respective approaches is the question of reconstructing the skull of the skeleton that Anil and Sarath discovered at a restricted site. Because their finding potentially implicates the state, Anil and Sarath have few institutional resources at their disposal to conduct their investigation. Given the circumstances, Sarath takes Anil to see Palipana, seeking his expertise in their quest to reconstruct the skeleton's identity. The, the interaction highlights their divergent perspectives, with Anil representing a commitment to objective knowledge based on reliance on science. Palipana, on the other hand, summarily rejects the possibility of objective knowledge. Having chosen to rely more on traditional forms of knowledge, he prefers to embrace the contingency of truth claims. Through its characters, the narrative thus constructs a classic Orientalist East-West binary. The epistemic dualism in the characterization of Anil and Palipana underwrites their approach to the war. While the novel certainly remains sympathetic to Anil as, as somebody who is well-meaning, it unambiguously privileges Palipana's choices and beliefs over Anil's. Anil's perspective on the conflict in Sri Lanka is rooted in human rights discourse. By turning bodies into representatives of race and age and place, she seeks to discover patterns that can identify both victimizers and victims. It is because of this faith in the value of her work that she makes it her mission to discover the identity of the skeleton, a mission questioned by both Sarath and Palipana. For Sarath, the Sri Lankan political landscape is simply too complex for Anil's uh, juridical methods to work. It is, uh, he, um, and I'm quoting here, it is not like Central America. He tells her, the government was not the only one doing the killing. You had and still have three cam camps of enemies, unquote. In this scenario, he warns Anil, there is no hope of affixing blame. It is Palipana, however, who represents the greatest challenge to Anil's position. Anil's basic fact-finding mission um, in quest for truth is a misguided one for Palipana because for him such truths simply do not exist. Palipana has little to overtly offer concerning the political landscape of Sri Lanka. His only uh, connection to the civil war is his niece, the daughter of his murdered sister and brother-in-law, a child whom he rescued from an orphanage and nurtures as his own. Since Palipana represents the kind of wisdom privileged by the novel, his political stance is instructive. While he does rescue his severely traumatized niece and nurses uh, her back to emotional health, he is completely unable or unwilling to nurture her social consciousness. She lives a secluded life with him. Moreover, after his death, we are told she just went into the forest. Seemingly, therefore, the only form of worthwhile engagement is a profound human connection, but one that is divorced from society. The novel seeks to offer a study in contrast between Anin on the one hand and Sarath and Palipana on the other. Nevertheless, I argue, the immediate differences notwithstanding, there is an underlying similarity among the three positions. The fundamental commonality is that all three maintain a stance of political disengagement. In Anil's case, despite her commitment to the discovery of truth, she displays no interest or involvement with contextual excuse me, specificity. She travels from one strife-ridden part of the world to another, conducting her work of victim identification with little investment in the lives and struggles of the people who are the subjects of her work. At times, Anil voices a bland, generalized reputation of state terror. And I quote, 
When I was in Central America, there was a villager who said to us, when soldiers burn our village, they said this is the law. So I thought the law meant the right of the army to kill us." Unquote. There are no contextual details regarding the particular conflict, the response or resistance of the people, the kind of state. The reader does not even learn which country in Central America Anil is referring to. In her construction of a world where powerless people are routinely brutalized, historical specificities are rendered inconsequential. Sarath, even as he's critical of Anil, his position is not very different from hers. He may be more knowledgeable about the factual aspects of the political landscape, but like her, does not concern himself with questions of justice or power or, res or resistance. Instead, for him, the reason for war is war. He identifies the three forces of the civil war as Tamil separatism, the insurrection of the insurgents, and state counterterrorism. While the Tamils and the states are well-known actor, actors, Sarath's take on the insurrection remains elusive. Much like Anil's Central America, the insurrection is not explained. Sarath adopts a neutral stance in which all guilt is shared. And to quote, now we have blood on all our clothes, unquote. Palipana is portrayed as having transcended politics and turned to a mystic life in the grove of ascetics. But in an arena that is politically fraught, an apolitical stance usually hides a very problematic politics. In Palipana's case, we know, for instance, that he was a nationalist and the main force of a pragmatic Sinhala movement. In the Sri Lankan political landscape, with its history of institutionalized discrimination against its minority Tamil population, a Sinhalese nationalism in its most charitable form is an exclusionary ideology. In fact, it incorporates aspects of fascism. Critics of the novel commend the standalone graphic vignettes of extraordinary violence as depictions of trauma. What goes unremarked in the novel's critical reception is that in these depictions, the perpetrators are invariably either the Tamil separatists or the anti-government protesters, i.e. the Marxist insurrectionists. Counterinsurgency operations by the state are barely represented and when mentioned are swiftly followed by broad generalizations in which everyone is deemed an equal culprit. Recall that Young approvingly describes Ondachi as taking the view that the different sides in the war are indistinguishable. But it does not take much to glean that the three players, the Marxists uh, fighting for economic justice, the Tamil freedom fighters primarily struggling for political justice, and the state brutally demolishing both kinds of resistance are quite distinct. That all sides have adopted strategies of violence against civilians does not change their distinctive political characters. A reading that refuses to engage with the politics in a politically fraught arena carries its own political consequences. The novel's admirers in post-colonial studies praise the fact that it makes no binarized assumptions about Tamil or Sinhala side of the civil war. This, however, is far from the case. The contradiction in Palipana's stance proclaiming a neutral perspective while hewing to the dominant state discourse actually captures the novel's own perspective. Ondachi shows his hand when he averts that both the insurrectionists and the Tamil fighters, uh, sorry, that for both the insurrectionists and the Tamil fa uh, fighters, the reason for war is war. In other words, the violence is an end in itself but the description does not enable the text to escape or transcend the political as young or other admirers would have it. In fact, it only reinforces the dominant political position of the state while erasing issues of oppression and injustice. The text whisks away the relevant contexts for the Tamils and the Marxists resort to violence and hence empties the movements of their political antecedents and aims. A twin move, as, move is at work in both the novel and the post-colonial commentary engen, engendered by it. A rhetoric of transcending the political along with a tacit complicity with the dominant statist position. This perspective is consistent with the belief that resistance against structures of power as exemplified by human rights discourse is ultimately futile if not counterproductive. Ultimately, the position amounts to an undermining of oppositional acts, of agency, 
Anil's ghost seeks to expose the perils of applying Western discourse, such as that of human rights, to post-colonial contexts like the Civil War in, in Sri Lanka. The novel ends up, however, offering a portrayal of the time and place without embedding it in politics or history, simply highlighting the deadly effects of war and legitimizing an oppressive state. The only redemption the novel suggests lies in an individualistic transcendence of social context altogether. Ironically, in so doing, the text and its subsequent celebratory comments deny agency to the post-colonial world, thereby reinstating the Orientalist historiography that they decry. Like in Ondachi's text, Shivanandan's When Memory Dies acknowledges, acknowledges the near impossibility of constructing a history in the destructive aftermath of colonialism. But it does not become the defining trope of the narrative. Instead, it takes on the challenge of writing history after colonialism. Once the commitment is made in the opening pages uh, to a reconstruction from bits and shards of stories, the novel steers away from well-trodden narrative modes of nostalgia or anguished incomprehensibility or exoticization in the telling of the tale. For Shivanandan, history and the subject are indeed fragmented, but to produce narratives that merely showcase such fragmentation is to remain trapped within that unacceptable reality. Through part history, part imaginative reshaping, When Memory Dies constructs an alternative record in response to both the onslaught of colonialism and the limitations of narrow nationalism. Here, subjectivity is the key to, construct, to the construction of an alternative account that takes on the task of painstakingly salvaging experiences of both oppression and resistance, and by doing so, building an alternative historical imaginary. The novel is a saga of epic, epic proportions, charting the history of the author's home country over the course of nearly a century. The story of three generations from the turn of the 20th century um, uh, through the 1980s meticulously reveals the process of the nation's colonial and post-colonial history from a subaltern perspective. The most remarkable feat of the novel is the way the logistics of complex historical phenomena colonialism, ethnic conflicts, class, warfare, terrorism, are always depicted through the intimate life experiences of its characters. In showing sympathetic characters as active historical agents, the novel implicitly challenges colonial and elite historiography by both presenting a people's history and showing history as a process. I'd like to highlight some of the central aspects of the novel that offer a study in contrast to Andachi's text. Unlike Anil's ghost, Shivanandan's novel does not treat the civil war as the defining event of the country. Instead, it situates the war in the context of the country's broader history, and instead of representing the war in terms of vignettes of disconnected violence, the novel offers an intimate portrayal of both its root causes and its dynamics. Even more significantly, unlike in Anil's ghost, the characters of this novel are not merely passive objects of history, but are active agents. Sri Lanka's history of resistance is woven here into the lives of its characters, informed by an astute sensibility, conscious of how the politics of colonialism, class, and race both interact and conflict with one another. The history of working class struggles, often actively suppressed, becomes buried in public memory. The narrative is primarily invested in resurrecting that memory. Saha, a central character, is educated in a colonial institution and acquires no knowledge of the country's history of labor resistance un until he comes to live with the labor organizer SW and his wife. There he learns of SW's lifelong work as an organizer and his attempts to stem the tide of communal acrimony nurtured by the British to undermine labor movements. Saha comes to understand that the history of the country as taught in his, in his missionary school was a history sanitized of any mention of workers' resistance. Um, and I quote, there were rebellions going on all the time, SW would tell him, but your school history books wouldn't tell you that, would they? Soon no one will know the history of our country, no history, no heroes, unquote. 
While Saha learns, the, learns of the 1912 rail strike and how the betrayal of a section of the elite that colluded with the British to break that strike, that dual theme of working class mobilization and its betrayal persist into the post-colonial period. And here again, the novel offers an important contrast to Anil's ghost, where the overt stance of disengagement notwithstanding, there is a clear authorial sympathy towards the state. Shivanandan's novel, on the other hand, highlights the continuity between the colonial and post-colonial states. Saha's son, Rajan, is witness to the brutal suppression of the 1953 general strike by a heavy-handed state machinery, except that this time it is a post-colonial state doing the suppressing. The strike was the first mass political action in the post-colonial era against an elected government, organized primarily to protest against the economic policies of the government and in particular the rising cost of rice. From a distraught friend, Rajan hears how the state came down on workers, and I quote, 12 of our people were killed by our government. He emphasized the hour. We expected it from the British, but this, unquote. It is the same betrayal that the next generation, that of Rajan's stepson, Vijay, experiences with the People's Liberation Front, a left organization of farmers, students, and workers formed in 1964 in response to disillusionment with the official left parties. As with previous events, the novel references the actual violent repression of the 1971 uprising led by the People's Front, during which the army was used against the population and more than 10,000 people connected to that organization were killed and twice that number incarcerated. The narrative shows that because of the transfer of power from the colonial to the post-colonial rulers did not mark a shift in the class character of the state, labor resistance in both eras became a target of attack and an occasion for sowing further division among workers. And the roots of the civil war are located precisely in such engineered divisions. It started with the British policies of divide and conquer, which entrenched separate nationalisms by the time of the country's independence in 1948. Pursuing the same policy, the post-colonial ruling class in response to mass movements for economic and social justice, the Sinhalese ruling class mobilized a race-based nationalism to appease the majority population. The institutionalized racism against the minority Tamils became the breeding ground for the civil war. The Tamil separatist movement adopted st strategies of terrorism and I'll speak in a moment of the text approach to that phenomenon, but it is worth pausing to note that the civil war became widely known in the West only for LTTE terrorism and also because the primary trope for representing, I'm sorry, and that also becomes the primary trope for representing the war in Anil's Coast. Since the phenomenon of terrorism is routinely hollowed out of political and social meaning, it is a singular achievement of when memory dies that it situates the birth of Tamil militancy in an understandable, if not favorable, light. In its inception, the movement captured the sense of betrayal and rage experienced by the Tamils, but mostly it expressed their demand for justice. The resort to terrorism is presented as the last desperate means adopted by the youth to redress the steadily mounting Tamil disenfranchisement and exclusion. Para, a central character, insightfully sums up the motivation of the young Tamil fighters, and I quote, The British took away their past. The Sinhalese took away their future. All they have is the present, and that makes them dangerous, unquote. While Tamil militancies accorded a deeply contextualized and sympathetic reading, true to the narrative's dialectic approach, it also unequivocally rejects the militants' methods and direction even while it endorses their cause. It shows the deterioration of an idealistic movement motivated by social justice into a top-down organization governed by dogma. Vijay tries to show the contradiction in the methods adopted by the movement to a young friend, and I quote, that way liberation never comes, and you know it. Socialism is the path to liberation, not just its end, unquote. Vijay also offers telling commentary on the suicide pill, something that has come to symbolize the Tamil terrorism in general. And I quote again, it was such a symbol of waste, of no hope, of death as a way of life. It had such a finality about it. 
Maybe it was all right at the beginning when it symbolized a heroic refusal to inform, at least it implied choice. But now that it has been raised to dogma, belief, ideology, it symbolized the end of choice. And the end of choice was the beginning of terror." Unquote. Both mainstream critiques and postcolonial fiction like Undachi's rendering of Tamil militancy often simply focus on the violence while remaining oblivious to the origin and dynamics of the movement. The end of choice is the beginning of terror, declares Vijay. In contrast to ahistorical and orientalist approaches, that one sentence invokes the entire history of an era and how it plays out in the individual consciousness. It contextualizes and explains the resort to terrorism without justifying it. What we have here is a portrayal remarkably nuanced both in its sympathetic identification of the causes of the movement as well as the denunciation of its trajectory. In conclusion, I want to return to what I observed earlier. Postcolonial theory aims to address the violence of colonialism, its suppression of the heterogeneity and humanity of the colonized. However, the corrective prop proposed by the theory of reading the colonized world primarily in terms of its particularity reinforces the colonial premise of othering or difference or what is now called Orientalism. We see precisely this dynamic at play in Anil's ghost, which upholds the specificities of the Sri Lankan context, its ethnic divisions, the civil war, and the eff affect of terror as phenomena that are not subject to historical or political analysis. Such representation, of course, dovetails with Orientalist renderings of the global south in terms of essentialized difference. Recall, uh, recall that uh, Frederick uh, Jameson makes the observation that while in the upholding of the difference of the colonized world, the operation of Orientalism is problematic, he says there is also no way out of that dilemma that doesn't involve a return to some form of vacuous liberalism. I've argued that Jameson is wrong in presenting only those two choices of Orientalist representation or an empty liberalism. Shivanandan's novel shows that is, it is indeed possible to appreciate the specific, specificity of the post-colonial context without falling into the Orientalist trap. When Memory Dies represents a post-colonial alternative that meaningfully challenges both colonial and elite discourses with its commitment to historical specificity, to subaltern agency, to portraying post-colonial subjects as actively engaged in the construction of their history rather than as colonized objects. It thus shows that the cultural and the experiential must be valued and situated within a universal framework. That's it. Thank you. I hope that wasn't too dense. As, as I was reading, I'm like, oh my god, this is too much. <laughs> Gives us a lot to discuss. Mm. <laughs> Can you provide some, some brief context surrounding this kind of idea that I made of this? I'm um, sorry, I can't hear you properly. Can you provide some like, brief context of, this, of what this is about? Or maybe like a summary of the whole book in itself? Which book? Oh, my book? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> He's talking about so many books. I had trouble following some of the... Ah. The, um, I bet you if I read it, like, it would be better what you had said. Um, so maybe you could like, tell us about the book a little bit. Sure. Kind of the ideas that you want sure, to sure, sure. <laughs> yeah. So, um, the book uh, is, you know, it's a... It's a dialogue, a contestation uh, of post-colonial theory. And, um, and as I uh, discuss in the introduction to the, um, to the book, post-colonial theory along with certain other theories emerges from this broad umbrella of the new left. Basically, um, you know, it, uh, it challenges, especially within literature departments, it challenges some of the sort of entrenched ideas of the canon, which was completely Western, when if you did, like for instance, um, 
in the 80s when I did, um, uh, when I majored uh, in English in India, all we studied were British literature, you know, from Chaucer to contemporary, nothing. There were no electives, everything was mandatory, you just had to become an expert in, um, in British literature. And, and this in a country which had an illustrious anti-colonial uh, movement, right? So this is a problem, and this is a problem everywhere. So post-colonial uh, uh, theory emerges in literature departments, and, uh, and it challenges that kind of, you know, that kind of entrenched sort of um, uh, colonized colonial curriculum, um, and it also offers a way of reading non-Western texts. So it does two things. One, it says that people should be reading more non-Western literature. And in that, it has been remarkably successful. And um, you know, it, it's hard now to find any kind of uh, you know. You you cannot major in in any uh, in in British literature, even uh, a major that's called English literature, and just study English literature. And that is completely we owe that to uh, you know to post-colonial studies. So that is great. But it also offers a particular lens with which it says that that kind of literature and more broadly the global south should be read. So, and that is where, you know, that, that, that is the problem that I'm trying to discuss here and in the book. And um, to put it, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, make it uh, more relatable and simple that um, if, if, colonial uh, ideologies sort of erases the, you know, the nations and the countries it colonizes, it, it takes away their concreteness, their specificity, their cultures, all of that is erased and it's, you know, recast in terms of the colonizer. So as, as a corrective to that, what post-colonial theory uh, proposes is, um, a complete focus on that specificity, and so much so that this time it is um, it is isolated. It, it it stands on its own, and in 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 doing that, it sort of exoticizes the colonized culture, the culture of the colonized, and there is the problem. So on the one hand, yes, of course we need to go back to the global south. Of course we need to study the culture, and all that is important. But that does. But once you start thinking of it as you know, a kind of construct that um, for which you need an entirely different kind of way of thinking, you are borrowing the colonizer's ideology that this is another world, that you are buying into that kind of othering of that, of that world. So broadly, that, that's, you know, that, that, is, that is the problem that I, um, that I discuss here. And then what I what I've said is much of if you look at much of postcolonial literature, it actually shows that you can do both. You can train your eye on the culture of the global south, but you don't have to therefore, uh, you know, uh, uh, adopt this kind of a uh, lens of exoticism that this is something else going on over there. That you can have a universalist framework, but you do not need to give up on the specificity of, of you know, of that part of the world. So that's broadly what is going on in the book. Um, and I, I do that, sh you know, showing contrasts of different kinds of literature the way I was trying to do it here. So there are several other studies in contrast um, in the book. I hope that sort of broadly addresses what you asked. Yeah. Okay, so like I, I like um, how you discuss like how like, um, especially within like the, like I guess Western media, like it's like Orientalism of like conflicts within the South. And um, I would like, I have a question where it's like, you, there, I, you, you address how there is a problem with how there's like this Orientalism, like, um, like experience within like of like looking at war in like the south and like how like oh it's different because like they're in the south and it's very different people. But what do you propose would be the solution to looking at this conflict? Like how do you teach others that hey don't look at this through like an oriental eye, look at this through like there's look at like the other side. Like how do you propose the solution to this problem? Great question. Great question. Read the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, that's a great question because the way the, yeah, of course the media often, uh, do, you know, borrows from those kind of orientalist tropes. The way to do it is pretty simple, is to actually study that part of the world, look at the history. Don't go for these ideas of this is the, you know, or the enchanted East or what have you. But look at the history, look at how the, the you know, uh, if you're looking at a particular struggle, look at root causes, look at movements. I mean, literally uh, a close study of the context solves the problem of Orientalism. Exoticism or Orientalism only comes into play when you are not looking at history and context. Because what it does is it picks up one or two tropes and makes that the whole thing. It's, you know, Simple words, in one word, it's stereotyping. It's a, it's a fancy way of saying stereotyping. You take something which is not false. Stereotyping is never false. You take something which is, you know, which is one little bit that is part of a bigger phenomenon, and, th and then you cast the, the entire phenomenon through that. So that's, you know, so the answer to that is look at the whole, right? Um, yeah, and on the, yeah, do you think it's possible for uh, authors who are kind of entrenched in that uh, particular country, like they, they know the context and they know the historical specificity, but in their entrenched specifically within like post-colonial, the post-colonial, uh, the world of post-colonial theory, and specifically in this way of looking at the world through the lens of radical difference, do you think it's possible for them to produce works that, even though they're familiar with their own culture and their own world, they, because of the fact that they, that they well, the work that I just discussed, yeah. When Memory Dies, is a classic instance of such a work, and I have discussed others. So absolutely, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, human beings are not passive subjects just because there's a theory, and even if, you know, you go to university, you see it, and, you know, it looks interesting, and it looks appealing, there are ways of fighting that. And um, writers, you know, also have, you know, have access to other skills. They have imagination. They have, you know, they have ways of relating to reality that is not merely theoretical. And that often produces results that are, you know, that goes way beyond theory and gives you a much better understanding of a context. So yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think there is any, you know, necessary bind there. Yeah. So if I'm understanding correctly, this it kind of pertains to talk a little bit more about how, okay, for example, like in high school, not maybe in high school, but back in middle school, like the textbooks usually were from a more European United States lens, and this kind of goes to talk about that it's not true, but then delves deeper into it. Is that what into the idea of like you know the white man's world? Mm -hmm. that, that kind of narrative. Is true? So is that, that's what post-colonial theory is, right? But it's not like that? So post-colonial theory, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you're struggling with it. So that's good. I mean, you're actually, no, that's, that's great. I mean, <laughs> I couldn't ask more from, uh, from my students. Um, so yeah, so you're right. You know, the, I hope that's not going on in any middle school curriculum anymore. I think that's, you know, nobody's, so, but I, I, I see your point. I hear your point. So that, you know, the, the idea that white man's burden, right? That the justification of colonialism, there is that discourse. And you're asking what is post-colonial theory doing? So post-colonial theory definitely questions that. So in that sense, you know, it is, a, if, you know, if you were to put in two, uh, if you had just two brackets, post-colonial theory is definitely good in that sense. You know, it's, it's, it's progressive in that sense that it questions that kind of colonial ideology. But the book says, but there are pitfalls within that theory. Yes, that is good, but while doing it, there are certain uh, blind spots in which post-colonial theory gets too entrenched, and it ends up um, recreating some of the tropes of colonial ideology. And that, that's, that's the book, right? I mean, I'm, I'm trying to just make it, like, I know it's, you know, yeah. Right, okay. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Um, this is just adding on to my question from before. So like, 
within like at least from my experience like how i view the world i see like how like media often like orientalizes like wars that are not western and then like it, it is like good like for like, like i understand how like you can combat this individually by like looking into the history of like the actual nation and the conflicts and the, of the people instead of like in just relying on like this one news source but how do you think like that you could like i don't know like the media could like re um reevaluate itself to like combat like this oriental trope within itself because like it's like such a systemic thing to find like within like the media and as well as like history textbooks like this oriental trope like it's so systemically ingrained in like our culture and like our teachings that like it's like kind of like a default to like look at other mm. cultures and wars as oriental so then how do you like combat that like such a big systemic like that's a great question and I, I obviously <laughs> do not have you know that is uh, you know it, it's above my pay grade how one uh, you know cures the, the, that kind of a malaise in which you know we are definitely captured that's a great question what you're asking is a much broader social question which is that th these kind of th th this kind of perspective is ingrained in media in politics how do we get out of that? It, it, it's so deeply ingrained. That's, that's your question, right? Yeah. I think, you know, I don't know who you is. Like, for instance, you're asking the question. So, of course, you know, you, you already know how. But how does it happen at a broader level? I think it happens through social struggles. Honestly, those are the times that people are able to see more. You know, it is uh, when people, um, you know, connect with uh, actual movements in the global south and they see what is it that's happening. I mean, you know, whatever, um, uh, you know, whatever country. Um, I, I think it's in, in times of uh, movements either here or when, uh, you know, when political people are able to have uh, that kind of solidarity with movements going on elsewhere, that's when you break it at a more societal level, those kind of, you know, entrenched kind of tropes. Um, but other than that, it's a question of, you know, deepening this knowledge, just understanding it, you know, running with it. Yeah, Jeremy probably has a better answer to this, I'm sure. <laughs> no, I'm sure you do, no, but yeah. question I had, which, I mean, because it does seem to me your book in part and, and your presentation in part suggests that there's a special role for art in mm. communicating mm. that that kind of like and and inspiring people to learn more. I mean, I can speak on a personal level that like on the recommendation of your work, I read When Memory Dies, the novel you talked about, and mm. I like learned a lot about yeah. Sri Lankan politics and history. Um, what's interesting though, also about your presentation, is that potentially like you know art has like a special kind of power but also a special kind of responsibility in your work and so like in a sense Bodanche's approach is like sort of an irresponsible artistic mm -hmm. way of going into something in the way you depict it which is that you know he actually encourages a kind of whatever we want to call it like lazy liberalism or a, a, a kind of mm -hmm. you know I, I like how you describe it, an apoliticism that ends up being a support for the status quo, um, has a, a barely disguised support for the forces of the state. So it's like art has, on, on your account, these special powers and also special responsibilities mm -hmm. for awakening exactly for sure. this kind of like deeper thing. For sure. I think, I definitely think, yeah. And I, you know, what, in politics and art in some ways, you know, they work together, uh, sometimes, you know, they don't. Sometimes it, it can be a very apolitical scene, but there could be great literature or art in other forms. I mean, I will add to what you said about when memory dies. You know, I, um, I grew up in India and Sri Lanka was like, it's literally, you know, it's like Mexico. It's like right there. Um, and, you know, you know that there's a conflict going on and, you know, so it was there in the news. I never connected to it. I'm like, yeah, yeah there's something going on there. You know, you know broadly what it is, but you know, there was never felt any kind of, there was no um, immediate connection. There was no affective connection to it. 
tail just happenstance i was here doing my phd and i was in the library looking for books i just happened to find shivanandan's book and i'm like okay this looks interesting it blew my mind you know it was like oh okay this is what this is the power of literature you know that the yeah it can it can completely change you so you know and that's literature but that's also true for different forms of art that it can capture uh the human imagination and break through a lot of you know this kind of ideology it has it definitely has that power for sure i'm glad you said that <laughs> yeah Could you be a little louder? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I think it's interesting because we had to read Odaji's work as part of the International Baccalaureate. We read about it in the family. Ah, okay. Like iconic. Yeah. That's part of the curriculum. But it's interesting. Like, I, I've always viewed Orientalism as a sort of like outside force looking in onto like, um, so like Western, not Eastern, for example. Right. And so it's interesting to see how it can be internalized by even authors who are part of conflict. Like, I never yeah. considered it like that. are asking very deep questions um you know jeremy used the word lazy um i i'll add to that i'll add something to that no no it's a very good word um profitable you know it, and i don't mean in a cynical way i mean you know if that is if something is a dominant discourse and uh partaking of that is you know becomes uh, it's easy easy thing to do very i'm i don't think people do it consciously you know but um it's it's great you know you ha- you get the political uh, credentials of writing about the global south and you're writing not just about the you know in a general form sense of the global south but of this sort of you know not a very well known country and the civil war it gives you tremendous you know street cred right and um so so then the, then the, then you know there is this easy way of going about it which people can relate to very uh, you know very readily because the media is also doing it politicians are also doing it that is you know that is the dominant discourse so to speak so the question in some ways is not even uh how somebody does it but how does one break out of it because you see a lot of well meaning people you, i see a lot of students struggling with it and saying oh is that what it is doing because that's all they have studied you know i mean that, i guess that's the only way i can answer it Sorry, were you were here? Oh, I did a question. Um, given all this, uh, it's Jungle Lahari just like here he decided to <laughs> write in Italian. Yeah. Um, what is what's your comment on that? Because that's a way of her breaking out of a, a given language, a language she was taught. I mean, good for her. Uh, honestly, um, I found that book really boring. The where she talks about her journey into italian i'm fine you know whatever you know she's free to do whatever and it's great i don't think you need to learn a different language to do that but you know as a personal thing whatever that's her thing but i also think yeah but you know in the same way as uh you know doing more of what you are doing does not change what you are doing so you know traveling or learning languages is not going to change it um you you can be as uh, you know subscribing as much to exoticism while speaking 10 languages so i don't think that in and of itself uh shows anything but i mean you know i i think it's i mean i've read her book i think it's a good solid liberal impulse where she comes from and i honor it i'm not like saying anything bad about that in and of itself but it's neither here nor there for me right, right? 
maybe add one other thing about the, um, to, to Maya's question. Um, I mean, you mentioned the position, you there are potential rewards in discourse. I think also like, I mean, you know, I think an important part of your talk was the, the fact that like, part of getting out of the Orientalist mindset is understanding that there are social divisions also within countries and that oftentimes, you know, oftentimes artists have an origin that is more middle class and middle class origin may set you up to identify more with say the middle class people administering the government right. as opposed to the, you know, the all very, very poor service workers who are having a protest or, and so like, you know, that is also a potential source of complication and we shouldn't just presume because someone happens to be, you know, from a particular country, that means they share every single other person in that country's experience, social position, interests, like these are all things that are complex and a lot of times what makes great political artists is in fact having to give up some of their like, you know, interests um, and uh, 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 sort of or working or against, though, even if you are from that class, working against what, what comes naturally. I think it's a great point. I, in fact, worked on uh, the exoticism in uh, Indian Anglophone literature and why, you know, so this is one of the things, the, the interconnection of class and exoticism, they go together, absolutely. I mean, in the, in the context of, you know, Indian English literature, uh, people are always shocked with this statistic when I tell them, you know, guess what percent of India speaks English? Anyone wants to take a wild guess here? Any, another one? Go lower, so, but another one? <laughs> Boy, you jumped there. <laughs> uh, he's like, I wouldn't be outbid it. Less than 10. Less than 10% uh, speak. So, <laughs> and yet that is, you know, that's the class of people you are seeing here. And, uh, and the literature then that's produced is, belongs to, you know, is, is read by a, a tiny minority. Of course, it, it's, there's a global audience, but the Indians who are reading it, of necessity, are from that tiny minority of privileged class. So that, you know, that changes the way, you know, the way you approach the world, the way you approach reality. It has, like, like you're saying, it's a, there is a familiarity amongst readers and writers and they understand where they come from, they understand the tropes, they relate to each other, and it produces, reproduces a certain kind of reality, which is divorced from the, you know, from the, from the greater sort of uh, facts of the, of the culture that they are representing. So definitely, yeah, class is a big factor. <laughs> Good questions, these are. <laughs> I'm sorry, political stance? Yeah, because you did mention that he, uh, in his interviews, what did the news goes, he, uh, he talks a lot about war, he talks a lot about uh, terrorist attacks, but coming home from the Chinese side, the Chinese side. So is he, like, does that come from something internal? Um, so I, I uh, lost a little bit. You're saying he talks about. Um, uh, like, Chinese like, terrorism, how he only. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. He only admits of terrorism. He depicts it. Look, I am, yeah, uh, I haven't seen any overt political writing from him, but he, this was one of the things that stood out for me, both in the book and how it goes completely unmentioned in the voluminous commentary on the book. Nobody's talking about the kind of representation. They're like, oh, you know, these, these, these vignettes of uh, violence, trauma, this, that, fine, do that. But when you actually start looking at the actors, it's, yeah, almost invariably, it's either the Tamil terrorists or the, you know, the, the, the leftist insurrection. It's never the state which is known. I mean, it's a 
known actor or known um, fact, you know, the, the violations of human rights that was conducted by the state. The, it's absolutely not there. Not just that, the characters who he's most sympathetic to are all pro-state. Mm -hmm. So there is a clear authorial bias over there. But then, you know, all the sort of flowery thing, oh, you know, uh, transcendence and there is always um, liberation to be had and uh, I don't know, 16th century Tamil poetry has it. So there is a lot of mumbo jumbo of that. But when you dig a little bit deeper, there is politics there. And the politics is one which, you know, is pretty supportive of the state. But saying that makes him kind of crass. So he'll, won't, he'll never come out and say that, you know. Post-colonial theory has roots in Heidegger, right? Which is the same. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you did. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. No, I, that's really interesting as well because when you're describing like what people, like positive things that people have to say about like Kondaji's work, it struck me as like this sort of violence that like transcends like political divides. But I feel like, you know, and I feel like no, no art can be apolitical, that's a personal opinion I have because it's just not possible. Right. Um, and so it's interesting to read into it that way. But do you think that if, I mean, if, if a work was created, that was like more, I don't want to say pacifist necessarily, because that like totally like, I, I don't want to invalidate any like, because it's, it's a great quote, like what is it, the end of choice is the beginning of terror. Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm, but like, would it, would it be a constructive thing if there were like, for example, works that displayed violence, but like more, let's say, roundly and cohesively rather than just being like a, a pro state on, I mean, think that would be like a stronger method that, because I don't think it's apolitical, but it's more leaning in that direction versus like making outright statements. Right. It. So right. is there like value to that? I'm not sure. Um, trying to understand your question. For one thing, I do feel this choice of, you know, upholding the civil war as something that defines the country. You know, you're making that your subject already. You're buying into a sort of Orientalist construct. Oh, look at this, you know, this crazy violence going on in that part of the world. It's already, you're ready for a horror show, right? The music is already there, so to speak, <laughs> you know? So, yeah, fine. I mean, uh, portray that. It is, after all, an important part of the history. But that's what Shivanandan portrays that, but he's doing it in a broader, you know, the canvas is much larger. So show the context of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know if I addressed your question. Um, I guess, you know, I guess I'm agreeing with you that if you, if you are able to portray people in their regular lives rather than these kind of sensational images, then obviously, you know, yeah, you'll get a much more realistic idea of what's going on. Yeah, not as sexy maybe, but. How many of you, I'm curious, how many of you have read Anil's Ghost? No, nobody, okay, <laughs> good. <laughs> but you said you've read other about Yeah, we have Which book? I mean, uh, sorry, which book? Oh, yeah, yeah, Run With Family. I mean, he's a good writer. Read it by all means. I mean, you know, I believe in reading everything. He's a good writer. There, you know, there is a reason he's famous. It's not just that he's, you know, being weirdly orientalist. He's a, uh, you know, so by all means read it, but you know, have your critical sensibility intact. So I, I recommend reading everything. <laughs> I was wondering if you were, I mean, I've been following a little bit of recent Sri Lankan politics. Yeah. Um, but, you know. Pretty bad stuff. Yeah. There was a popular revolution. The presidential palace was taken. And yeah. I just, uh, I admit to still not having totally connected the dots between the period of Sri Lankan uh -huh. politics you're discussing here yeah, and yeah. contemporary. Do you have any thoughts about kind of bringing us up to speed a little bit to the present? Yeah. Um, you know, after 2009, when they basically decimated LTTE and they said um, we'll go for some kind of a federalist solution, it can't be two state, but then they gave up on that as well, you know, because there was no movement, no pressure, they never wanted to do it, so that's gone. So I feel like 
there is not much of a continuation of that so much, but it's definitely very much part of you know people's public memory and it's, it's such recent history, so it plays a role. I was, uh, you know, speaking to what you're saying, I was very interested in reading some reports of how in the wake of this, this new movement, um, you know, people were doing this kind of memorializing uh, past victims and Tamils featured uh, in a big way in that which has never happened before. These were mainly Sinhalese people, you know, and that has, first of all, the government had banned any kind of public uh, kind of acknowledgement of Tamil deaths. So that went out the window, and now you know the, it, there is a much more inter. Uh, I, I again, I, I don't know. I'm not following the political history very closely, but I think this current movement has you know brought the communities together in an interesting way. Maybe because the LTT movement is totally trounced, so nobody's afraid of that anymore. But maybe that has helped in bringing the two sides together, and. You know, it was the LTD thing always was, uh, the basis was always economic and it had a broadly leftist perspective. So in some ways, you know, I mean, again, uh, I'm not vouching for it because my knowledge is not very deep of what's going on. But I, I from the reports that I read, it looked hopeful on that score. I mean, it's pretty awful <laughs> what's going on, yeah. I mean, it's good that they got rid of the president and all that, so that was pretty amazing stuff, yeah. Maybe time for one last question, if anyone has one. Otherwise, let's go to the next semester. Let's <laughs> 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 jump forward. Um, okay, well then, let's give a hand to Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it. I love talking to you guys. Great questions. <laughs> yeah.